Welcome back to the Tapes Archive podcast, where we release interviews that have never been heard before. Please listen to episode 000, an introduction for the full backstory about this podcast series. On this episode, we have the drummer Neil the Professor Peart of the band Rush. At the time of this interview in 1990, Mr. Peart was 38 years old and was out on tour with Getty and Alex in support of the band's 13th studio album, Presto. In the interview, Neil gives us some insight into his writing process, where he gets inspiration for his lyrics, some Canadian and world politics, and why he thinks the band has stayed together for this long. As always, we have music critic Mark Allen at the helm conducting the interview. Before we get to the interview, we have a couple of housekeeping items. If you would like to support the show, please go over to the website at thetapesarchive.com and click on the support button. On there, you'll find many ways to show your support for the show, and all of them are free. While on the website, check out Mark's blog for more context of this interview and for some personal insight from Mark himself. One last thing, the Tapes Archive podcast is a proud member of the Osiris Podcast Network a global community connecting passionate fans with podcasts and experiences about artists and topics you love. Thanks for tuning in, and now it's time to open the vault. Uh, Yes, hello, is Mark there, please? This is Mark. Hi, Mark, it's Neil Peer calling from... Hi, how are you doing? Not too bad, how are you? Oh, good, thanks. Well, where are you calling from today? Hampton, Virginia. Uh Uh-huh, where are you playing? Are you playing there tonight? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, how long a tour are you on? Uh, we went out in the middle of February, and we'll be ending the end of this month. Oh, so that's not bad. You can see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> uh, um, I wanted to start out by asking you, did you happen to uh, see the quote from Randy Johnson, the Mariners pitcher? No. Um, you know, he pitched a no-hitter the other night, uh-huh. and um, he said that, he, this is his quote, he said, I just brought, bought a drum set. Uh, I played it an hour and a half before the game. I was listening to Rush, but I don't think the drummer for Rush has anything to worry about. <laughs> so, that's nice. Yeah, I thought you were get a kick out of that. Yeah, so, that's uh, cool. Yeah. Um, what was I say? What, what happened to the band's first drummer? Uh, ill health. Oh, really? Yeah. It, it, where, what is he doing now? Is he still uh, alive? Yeah, oh. yeah, I just saw him last week. Does he, uh, is he friendly about it? Or, I mean, oh, yeah. yeah it, was, it was a mutual situation, yeah. Because uh-huh, you would think that, geez, I mean, here's a guy who, uh, I mean, it's it's not a Pete Best thing, but it's it's pretty damn close. You know, I mean, <laughs> he leaves a band and, and the band goes on to have, you know, a long, successful career. Yeah, you know, because it was mutual at the time, he wasn't happy, so uh, you can't regret a decision like that, you know. That everybody faces decisions like that in their lives where they look back and say, well, what if I hadn't done that? But the thing is, at the time, you know, the circumstances said, this is the thing to do, so you do it. What is he doing now, do you know? Uh, actually, he hasn't played for years and years. Uh-huh. He's just starting to toy with the idea of doing a bit of playing. Is, is he just like in private business or something like that now, do you know? Yeah, actually, uh, in gym and bodybuilding, predominantly, as far as I know. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. that's, that's kind of unusual. <laughs> and uh, one other question about early Rush. When you first heard Getty's voice, what, what did you think? Uh, I don't remember thinking anything at all, really. Really? I mean, it's just, it's such an unusual voice, and I... I you know, I think the first time you hear it, yeah, maybe you don't think anything of it, but uh, and maybe you get used to it after a while. But well, it was it was the time too. I mean, in the mid '70s, a lot of singers sounded like that, so <laughs> it, it, it didn't sound, I guess, as strange as it has come to seem over the passage of time. You know, in uh, at that particular time, it, um, and also, it, ironically, the reason his voice ended up in those registers was because of the technological limits of those days, and the reason why a lot of other bands singers became very stentorian was because uh, amplification you know when when they were playing in basements and clubs and stuff it was so difficult for the singer to be heard because all the guitar players had 100 watt marshals you know yeah. and the singer had a little 50 watt PA <laughs> so uh, a lot of times I think that those singers of that time were driven that way just for the getting the voice to project over all of that noise mm-hmm. oh. so so if you, in, in his quieter moments I mean, do you guys play acoustically and uh, sit around and and uh, you know work things out that way can he does he sing in different registers oh of course yeah, yeah. part of the great thing is, is having a register that wide you know and, and a lot of times in our songs too he sings in normal register and, and you know pushes himself up higher just for uh, the musical power of it and the vocal uh power of it and also because he's able to you know because his range is that broad but it's, uh, as I'm told before I knew him he used to sing a lot in a uh, do you know who David Clayton Thomas is? Sure. I guess uh, apparently in the early days that's what he used to sing like so. 
<laughs> that's a pretty wide range. I mean, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, that's very interesting. Um, let me see. And on to well, it's I guess we'll go to the to the new album for Star. Just leaping twenty years ahead. Yeah. For, well, for now, let's just skip around. I have these questions, but okay. they're not in any kind of order, and they're right. usually better organized. But screw it. No um, let me see. Uh, th- one of these. Um, record company deals that they send out this rush profile thing i was listening to and uh, uh there's a quote you know getty is on there saying that touring is probably the most difficult thing for him now because it's you know it's basically it's two hours of performing and 22 hours of you know doing nothing or yeah. you know just going stir crazy uh, how do you handle that after so long and i guess also why do you want to handle it after yeah that's a good question actually in both levels um it was a very difficult decision to make this time whether to tour or not, and particularly for me because of that factor, that there are a lot of things I'm interested in life and a lot of goals I want to pursue, and not many of them can be done while you're moving around every day. Uh, so I was very reluctant to think about touring and committing, you know, six months of my life to basically doing one thing. You know, it's it's, a, it's what you have to recognize about touring is that you're not really creating, you're recreating. So it's, it's like the old joke about the person that says they have 20 years of experience when they have one year of experience 20 times. And it's, <laughs> touring is like that. You know, you have one night's experience 200 times over. So it is definitely recreating the same thing. And the, the um, I guess the accomplishment factor at the end of it is, is dubious. In the early days, it was more measurable. And at the end of a tour, I would feel, you know, accomplished that I'd learned a lot and I developed a lot during that period of time just by playing every night and by the band playing together. It was good for us as a band. But at a certain point, you, you kind of tend to peak out in your uh, potentiality. So I, I felt that learning curve getting shallower and uh, the increments of improvement becoming, you know, less measurable. So consequently, the satisfaction rate was less. But the, I, I always feel too that uh, for a band playing live is the essence of it you know it is what makes a band a living breathing thing is getting out in front of an audience and playing live with all the risks and the spontaneity and the immediacy of that and the fact that it is one night is is a microcosm you know each performance in spite of the fact that it's part of a chain of them each one is unique and each night when you go up the the stairs to the stage it, it is a feeling that okay tonight i'm going to do it right you know that the perfectionist aspect of it is that every show um in fact, Eddie and I were discussing once that uh, the pressure of a show releases at the first mistake. <laughs> you know, the first time you make a little inaccuracy or something that you don't like goes by, in a sense, you're free, you know, because for the first few songs, everything goes well and you're playing really well and you're thinking, okay, this is it, this is it, this is going to be the perfect night. And then the first time a little flaw comes out of that, that's when you're free, you know, okay, um, now that's upset it, now all I have to do is, is play as well as I can, you know, I'm not achieving, I'm not aiming to achieve that perfection anymore. So there are, there are a lot of funny little um, aspects of playing live that that become a very real part of your life night after night, obviously. But the, the main factor was that I wanted Rush to be a living, breathing thing. So I felt, well, I, I really don't want a tour, but I want Rush to be a touring band. So in, in that kind of a context, it was the only thing to do. You know, the only thing worse than not touring was, or the only thing worse than touring was not touring, in my mind. So that was the, the genesis of, of my personal decision to do it. And as far as how you deal with that is, I, I kind of set myself goals to achieve during the tour. You know, I figure the tour's there and um, the shows will take care of themselves as long as I keep the right attitude when I walk up those stairs every night. <laughs> so they can be used. For instance, this tour I set out to learn something about American art and I figured that that can be my mission. So in every city, if I have an afternoon free or a day off or something, I'll go to the local art museum and um, browse through the paintings and and try to learn something about it because I really didn't know anything about it before. So it was a gap in my knowledge that I wanted to fill and it, it's been very satisfying. That wow, that's tour, I've been to 20 odd museums in different cities on this tour and, and have acquired quite a lot of knowledge about it. So that's satisfying and in other, in other tours I would uh, decide that I wanted to see more of the real United States so I carried a bicycle with me and I'd go out on, again on days off or an afternoon before the show and ride around the city or the countryside and see some of America that I'd been missing for the last 15 years of traveling you know I, I kept thinking that well look I've traveled around the United States for all these years and you, all musicians like to think they know about the places they've been to but of course touring is not like traveling any more than being a tourist is like being a traveler so I set up to uh, to change that too and that's really served me well that I always have an escape you know I'm, as I talk to my bicycle sitting here and anytime I want I can get on it and go out you know and be independent and also 
in the the, uh, the secondary benefit of it is I, I have been exposed to the real America, you know, and the real people in America too, not just fans and not just promoters, <laughs> not just airport people, you know, just get out and ride around and look and, and think about what I'm seeing and why it is the way it is and all of that. So it's it's very refreshing and it's also very stimulating to have that kind of experience. So I tried this time to incorporate touring with that and I always have an agenda of reading where I bring out, you know, a, a carefully chosen selection of books that I really want to read. And it, it, Sundays, you know, Sunday's great because the Sunday New York Times and I have the crossword puzzle. <laughs> you know, all these little things add up to other levels of enjoyment and, and accomplishment that a tour can provide. So, so you're like a real human being on the road, or as close as you can be. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's, that's the aim of it, too, and that's that's an incisive kind of comment, too, when you think about it. It's, it is a dehumanizing atmosphere. You know, you're traveling around in a very isolated and very unreal situation where people are constantly reacting to you in a very unreal and essentially inhuman way. You know, they're looking at you as an object rather than a person. <laughs> and uh, that gets very alienating. And of course, the history of rock is, is full of those kinds of stories of alienation and the prices that people have paid for that alienation. And people as, as intelligent as Roger Waters have been able to articulate it for everybody else too. But uh, to, the, to the people at large, it is glamorized and mythologized and seen to be some kind of dream world as if you were traveling around in a, a fantasy castle, you know. And the reality, obviously, is, is far different than that. Is that where the uh, line, living on the lighted stage, approaches the unreal? Yeah. Comes from, yeah. yeah. Well, it, it makes perfect sense, really. But, uh, if you let it, you know. Yeah. That's, that's the choice we made early on, is that, you know, we weren't going to do that. And we part of the, the good thing for us is that we did come up slowly, in a sense. You know, our, our success came to us by by slow degrees really so we were able to watch other bands and how they responded to it and how they acted and if they chose to play that role and the price they paid for it you know and we realized that um, a lot of the bands that we opened for some people could play that role successfully because they were strong enough and because they were cynical enough but when we looked at other people who were more sensitive or more unstable um, they got lost in it you know they played the role and, and became the role a part of the thing that Superconductor is about on the new album too is that the role becomes the actor and we saw that happen to so many musicians they went out and played this larger than life goal and soon they perceived themselves that way and if they were unstable of course then that leads to the substance abuse and the tremendous uh, uh, unhappiness you know that even success can bring people to hmm. uh, you know it, I don't know I, I, you're putting it you know in a way that I've always thought about it but I, I've never heard anybody articulate it that way so it's kind of nice <laughs> but, yeah because uh, that's so true you know people do they look at themselves and you know if they've been on the road for a while and, and they're getting good you know audiences and they're selling lots of records they, they become so incredibly important or at least in their own mind yeah, uh, in their own mind yeah, and yeah. I mean there are really two ways you can look at that kind of adulation I think you can either be embarrassed about it as I am or you can embrace it you know and say these people love me I love me too <laughs> so then you know you walk out back out the backstage door and you just want to stand there with open arms and bask in this adulation you know because you think you deserve it or if again like me you, you don't think you deserve it then you're just embarrassed and you want to run away and hide you know? mm -hmm. but I think it, although they both have their prices I, I think uh, the latter aspect is far healthier in the long run. Do you, um, when when you're out and you're in art museums, etc., I mean, have you run in, have people run into you and know who you are? Now, um, or is no, it... again, that's very much a question of body language. Uh -huh. you know, I had a funny experience in Washington when I was going through the National Gallery, and I kept being in the same room with this guy who was wearing a Rush t-shirt from the concert the night before, <laughs> you know, who had just seen us. But, you know, I... I it's the way you carry yourself again you know you don't make eye contact and you look down and look away and you look at the painting <laughs> and the, the guy never noticed me yeah that's pretty funny because yeah, you know, it's the same walking down the street if you if you make yourself um, noticeable then you will be noticed but if you try to be anonymous actively then a lot of times you can achieve it <laughs> and you know you pick up little tricks along the way Pat Travers once taught me something years ago actually when he wanted me to come out to his bus after a show and, and hear something he was working on and I said well look there's 5,000 people out there how are we going to get to your bus and he said no no just put your head down and move fast <laughs> and he was right we went right through that crowd and, and nobody noticed us mm -hmm. <laughs> so it is tricks you learn along the way again if you want to be that way you know if you want to protect your anonymity then you soon learn you soon learn how to 
you know, just how not to be noticed and how to be anonymous. So you didn't want to walk up to that guy in the National Gallery and go, hey, nice t-shirt. I saw them last night. Weren't they great? <laughs> <I> really? <laughs> hey, man, did you love the show? <laughs> yeah, it's good. It would have been fun. You know, it'd be funny to do that, you know, because if the guy recognized you, he'd flip. And if he didn't, you know, you get a pretty good sense of, uh, of what your average fan was thinking. Yeah, but unfortunately, when you've been jumped on, you know, constantly for years and years that alarm goes off when, when you see a thing like that and all you want to do is avoid it as much as possible. Because obviously you can't escape it all the time. I mean, when you're in a city playing, people expect to see you there and uh, when you when you go up to the gig to go to work or when you come out leaving work, you know, you're kind of in a context in which anonymity is hard to come by. When you deal with that all the time, when you're away from it, um, for me anyway, I try really hard to preserve the, the distance. Yeah, I always think that the, uh, the guy, the guy who has the best life is the guy who owns Walmart because he's a billionaire and no one knows who he is. Yeah, yeah, I always thought the same thing. That <laughs> having wealth and freedom and independence and all that without fame is far preferable. But then there are people unlike you and me who, who don't feel that way, who want the fame and would rather be famous and poor you know, than, than rich and unknown. Yeah. And that, that's an aspect of human nature that you have to deal with. And again, I see that in a lot of musicians too. You know, Some of them, the affirmation of people loving them is much more important than any of the other parts of it, you know, that, that's what they bask in, that's what they, in some cases, got into it for, you know, a lot of musicians will tell you, well, I got in a band to get chicks, <laughs> <laughs> as banal as that sounds, um, it, it, ex you know, it expands into a bigger syndrome in their personalities, and that desire for, uh, you know, approval and admiration and all that becomes their whole reason for being, and uh, again, it becomes a very unhealthy conflict, I think, in, in a person, just to base your whole life on what other people think of you for a start. On a couple of the songs, well, first back to the uh, the profile disc, you mentioned on there uh, about Chain Lightning and you explained that song. I was wondering, how old is your daughter? Twelve. Twelve, okay. Uh, is War Paint uh, written for her? No. Or, no? Okay. No, in fact, that's written for, uh, well, in a sense, all ages, but I was thinking more of... Uh, people who are supposed to be grown up <laughs> but are still acting that way you know I, I said it in the imagery of adolescence but uh, I was definitely thinking of and and my theme arose from uh, thinking of people of my own age who still act that way so vanity is as uh, the great liar you know yeah. and I see that so much where people that I've grown up with and if they haven't done well in life it's all somebody else's fault and you know that kind of thing that they're just waiting to be discovered and and people that have done well are lucky and and they're just unlucky lucky because they haven't and all that it really comes down to vanity at, at, at the root of it and that's all the stuff I was thinking about and then I just chose to use adolescent imagery to express it see my reading of it was that maybe you know your daughter was at an age where you know she was getting ready to go out and you were you know it was kind of like a, a fearful father song uh, no actually not at all yeah. okay. uh, see, that's, but I guess people get out of it but they you know, yeah, they, they see okay. what they want to yeah, say I have right? no problem with that at all but uh, there are a lot of songs on, on this album particularly where I think I've, I've tried to learn in lyrics to project myself into a situation and express it as if it were um, autobiographical, but in, in fact most of the time it's not. You know, a lot of the little vignettes that uh, songs like Presto or uh, Hand Over Fist, they, they express little what seem to be dramatic situations and they seem to be true, but in fact they're not. I made them up <laughs> to express a point, you know, to... Uh, I made them up to to illustrate something, I guess, in a, in a literary sense. But uh, no, I'm lucky. My daughter's not superficial, so I don't have those fears. Yeah, or, or the way I just looked at it was, you know, here's you know a, a girl who's growing up, you know, wants to grow up a little faster than than she should. That's right. No, I understand that, and it's, it's certainly not a bad reading at all. But uh, no, in the, the wrong part, reading, but not bad. <laughs> no, not even wrong. No, I think the essence of it is that you try to allow for all of those, and one of the reasons I chose that imagery was certainly to allow that interpretation. And part of the idea of reconciling the universal ideas with the personal ideas is, is to try to be a little bit uh, either ambiguous or ambivalent, I guess is more the right word, um, just trying to allow for it, for both of those interpretations. And, and uh, as long as there isn't an opposite one available, you know, which happens in some songs. There was a song of ours called Middletown Dreams on uh, Power Windows, and it was about the power of dreams and how about people at any stage of their lives can go out and 
and do something, you know, can go out and make their lives true and make their dreams come true. And uh, to the cynical people, though, in the world, they read it as, as a cynical song, that the fact that these were all washed up people who were, you know, tragedies of life. And in fact, in each case of the characters I drew in that song, I did draw from life. And I talked about, or I, I thought about uh, a writer like Sherwood Anderson, who, when he was 40 years old, decided to stop being an ins insurance salesman and become a writer, or Paul Gauguin, who decided to stop being a stockbroker and become a painter, you know. I was thinking of real people like that in the song and expressing the fact that uh, at a certain point in their lives, they just said, enough, you know, I'm going to go back to the dreams that I left behind and, uh, and make them true. But a lot of people read the exact opposite thing into the song and saw it as being very cynical about how these, these you know, insignificant little people were failures and tragedies, which was what I meant exactly the opposite. You know, here are, here are people that would be perceived as being small who went out and made big, big dreams come true. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite lines on the album, and I, I really think this is the best Rush album that I've heard. You know, and, and it's amazing to me that that you guys can can keep making good albums, and and uh, just because I, I would think that that creatively, you know, you start to to just get tired of it, and I would think yeah. you get bored with the whole process. But uh, it's anyway. more dangerous for a single artist than it is for the three of us, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, oh, well, the, the line I like is uh, is uh, from the title song where you say, I radiate more heat than light. Right. And I wondered if, uh, what do you think about Rush? Does Rush radiate more heat or more light? <laughs> Hopefully a balance of the two. <laughs> Actually, the germ of that line is, is kind of interesting. During the uh, American um, presidential debates, mm -hmm. uh, I was... I got very interested in it all. I love debates anyway, but the way that they were all set up and the whole stage-managed uh, show business of it and all that. So I was faithfully watching the presidential and the vice presidential debates, and coincidentally in Canada there was an election going on at the same time with the same kind of uh, debates among the leaders of the parties and so on. But uh, at the end of one of the American presidential debates, uh, that line was used, I think, by Dan Rather or somebody saying that, you know, during the course of the debate created much more heat than it did light. Uh -huh. and I thought that was a beautiful image, so. I wrote it down and kept it. <laughs> yeah. well, that's that's good. Do, are, are, do do you get lyrics? I mean, do, do lyrics come to you like that from other sources? Oh, definitely so. Yeah, I, that's why I keep the notebook in hand and from the newspaper or from television or for some, something somebody says or a passage in a book that I'm reading or just a combination of two words that occurs to me when I'm riding my bike. You know, all those kind of things. I often come back from a bike ride with my map covered with little notes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> So, so you're always working, even if you're enjoying yourself. Yeah, that's right. I read a great quote once, uh, a writer saying that the hardest thing for a writer's wife to learn is that when he's looking out the window, he's working. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. That is a good line. I'll have to remember that. Yeah, My wife says, what am I doing? You know? <laughs> um, let me see. Um, I, since you were talking about politics, and I think that uh, I just was in Canada a month ago mm -hmm. and found the uh, Meech Lake Accords quite interesting and, and mm -hmm. really the, the, the intent of it all. What do you what do you think is going to happen, and uh, what do you hope happens? Oh, it's just so confusing. It's as if uh, the United States had had no constitution and no Bill of Rights for for two hundred years, you know, yeah. and then suddenly today, uh, President Bush and all his buddies decided to sit down and and ratify a constitution and a Bill of Rights. You can imagine what, what kind of chaos that would lead to. Oh, you know, it's yeah. fine to have it in place. And that's what Canada faced. Basically, we had no constitution except that which tied us to Britain. And uh, it was so-called repatriated, you know, eight or nine years ago. But still, it was nothing was done with it. It wasn't... Uh, it wasn't drawn out and it wasn't agreed to and all the, the uh, premises of life, for instance, weren't, weren't put down in the way that they are in the American model. So that's basically what they're trying to do right now and trying to do it at this point in history, you know, with so many factions and so many uh, warring points of view and especially in Canada with, with the Quebec situation too. Oh, it's just a big mess. <laughs> I, I wonder, I mean, do you think Quebec can, uh, can leave or right, will leave? Not in practical terms, no. I spend a lot of my time in Quebec, so I'm very sympathetic to the Quebec cause. Um, but, you know, in, in real terms, one of the pundits said that uh, if Quebec wants to leave, fine, just tell them to pay off their portion of the national debt and they can go. <laughs> and that right away, you know, makes it an impractical consideration. Yeah, we were in, um, in Prince Edward Island, and the, the um, 
uh, gee, I don't know who it was, Buchanan, I, what is his job there, uh, title there? Not Premier? Premier, yeah. Premier, yeah. And, uh, he, and he had made, a, I guess, an offhand comment that uh, there wouldn't be anything left for that part of Canada to do but to join the United States, which, of course, everybody just went berserk about. It. <laughs> you know, they didn't want to have anything to do with yeah. us. And, and by the same token, you know, I, and I asked people about that, and they said, well, you know, we like our national health insurance and, uh, and some other things. And they said, and by the same token, you know, the United States wouldn't want us because we're the, the poorest area of the country. And, uh, yeah, well, I'm not a nationalist by any means, and in fact, I would quite happily sign a petition to join Canada to the United States because I'm equally at home here in the States as I am in Canada, you know, and I don't perceive a lot of differences really, although that would have me lynched <laughs> if I was saying this in Canada. But, you know, I think all of that is just kind of stupid, and the, so much of our election hinged on the free trade issue too, which is, you know, completely died down into business as usual. Well, I think uh, the, the biggest difference that I perceive is just a general awareness uh, that, that Canadians are much more aware of the United States than the United States is of Canada. Yeah, but that's, that's strictly um, a question of degree, too. I mean, there are 200 million people in the States and 20 million in Canada. And it's a big neighbor to us where... Uh, a big neighbor in humanistic terms to us where the reverse doesn't really apply. So I don't have a problem with that. And the same thing in Canada, we learn a lot about British history too. You know, what's the point of it? The only reason is that historical, you know, tying of the apron strings really, although we don't learn about African history, we don't learn about Chinese history. Um, You know, so it isn't really objective either. You know, the fact that Canadians know a lot about the United States, well, so they should, you know, so anyone in the world should know a lot about the United States as far as I'm concerned. Well, I think there's some truth to that, but, uh, you know, we just tend to have very little idea here about what goes on in other countries, you know, unless it's the country of the moment. You yeah, know? Well, so does everybody else. So I, I was doing some uh, writing about Africa recently, and I came across a, a tragedy that took place in the country of Cameroon where a, a bubble of volcanic gas came out of a lake in Cameroon and killed 1,700 people in their sleep, you know, or, or where there's an earthquake in China and it kills tens of thousands of people. It might get a few column inches on an inside paper, but if there's a, an earthquake in San Francisco, you know, with 40 people killed, you don't hear about anything else for <laughs> weeks. And Canadians are exactly the same. You know, if there's a murder in Barrie, Ontario, uh, our newspapers are full of it for months. Mm-hmm. But, you know, again, if tens of thousands of people are killed by a horrible tragedy in China, nobody really cares. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's a tribal thing, really. And the farther away from your tribe something happens, the less important it seems to be. I think it's just that's just human nature more than a, a national, you know, tr- attribute. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, the, I, I have two other things I wanted to ask you. One is, uh, what do you think it is that's kept the band together for so long? Um, as trite as it might seem, I would say friendship. You know, just the fact that we've retained not only respect, but also affection for each other over the years. And there, there are many factors that contribute to that, too, in terms of the kinds of people we are and the, and the, the way we relate to each other and the different kinds of, you know, um, personalities that we can each complement. Oh, that's a part of it. But essentially, it does come down to just being friends and, and respecting each other. And, and satisfaction, I suppose, if we weren't satisfied with the work that we did together, that would end it all, regardless of friendship. But uh, I think, as I outlined in the uh, Scissors, Paper, Stone story, that at the bottom line of it, we have fun together. You know, we have fun working together and we have fun playing together. So, um, in essence, what else would you want? You know, that's why there haven't been solo albums and that's why there hasn't been uh, a band break up and that's why there haven't been crises and scandals in the papers, you know, it's because those those immutable things are those, um, those matters of longevity as far as job satisfaction and, uh, and good interpersonal relationships, to put it in corporate terms, those kind of things have survived, you know. But, but you know, I mean, bands that have existed for as long as Rush, hell, many that have existed for a shorter time, you know, the, the, the members just hate each other. Oh, yeah, <laughs> much more than people perceive, and you probably have more insight into that than, than most people do, how, you know, people go to a concert and they see the band playing on stage together, and then at the end of the show they see them all bow and hold hands and all that stuff, and then at the end they go to their separate dressing rooms and get into their separate cars and, and sometimes even stay at separate hotels. I saw... Um, the live video the police did just near the end and I, I realized that during the whole course of like an hour and a half they never looked at each other once yeah. you know there was no um, there was no interaction between the guys and the band but not only that there was no acknowledgement of each other it was three guys on a stage playing not together but playing individually under one name 
Yeah. So yeah, that that is, I think, the reality far, far more than than people have any idea. Well, so you must feel felt, must have felt very good when you saw something like that. You know, is there yeah, a three person band? Yeah, just being in the middle of a tour and and knowing the kind of interaction that the three of us go through on stage and off. You know, where that. That just could never be, you know, for uh, for Getty and Alex not to be punching each other around at the front of the stage or, you know, chasing <laughs> each other around and all the silly things that we do to entertain ourselves on stage. It's hard for me to imagine working without all of that, you know. To me, it's such a part of what, what we are and have been that uh, being in the middle of a tour and seeing sort of an object lesson like that of the opposite, it makes you feel very fortunate. I just feel really glad that this band happened to have worked out interpersonally the way that it has. Yeah, but that is really nice. You had mentioned earlier that you had uh, some some uh, interests and some things that you might have pursued otherwise had you not toured. Uh, well, what kinds of things uh, are you dealing with yourself? Uh, well, prose writing interests me enormously. Mm -hmm. Just learning about it and uh, trying to develop the skill of putting what you think in words, you know, in versus kind of a, a very dis different discipline. So working on lyrics is a very different mentality than thinking in terms of sentences and paragraphs and the structure of, of chapters and all of that. So um, prose is something that I've studied by reading, obviously, all of the greats that have done it, but also by trying to do it myself. Just you never know how hard something is until you try it, really. Um, so that's something that has absorbed me more as a hobby, really. I don't fancy myself as, you know, sort of the great Canadian novelist by any means, but it's something I really want to know how to do. It's a skill that I, I want to develop. So uh, I spend a lot of my time outside of the band uh, working on that in, in one area or another. So are you, uh, I mean, do you have a work in progress now? Uh, always, yeah. Uh -huh. But I, I hate to dignify it that much because I don't have aims of publication or anything like that. It, it's just, to me, an apprenticeship in a way that uh, I keep turning out pieces of work just to teach myself things, and then I put them aside, and, and six months later, you know, I look at them and, and see that I've progressed from them. So it's, it's like taking on anything new, the learning curve is steep, where with music, after having played drums for 20-odd um, years now, the learning curve is very shallow, you know, I've learned a lot and practiced a lot and really put a lot of time and effort into learning the craft of it, so um, learning new things is partly not that appealing and also partly um, futile, you know, to, to spend six hours a day, you know, every day learning how to do a faster paradiddle, it <laughs> seems pretty much irrelevant to me now, where I can spend six hours a day, day after day, learning how to put sentences together, and it is very satisfying, because it's new and because the improvement is so measurable, you know, I can understand what I'm learning and, and, uh, and read a lot of, of other people's ideas on how to do it and try to apply them and uh, and all of that. So I, but so I, say I, I don't like to dignify it too much because I, I don't consider that I'm a writer by any means, but I'm trying to learn how to. One, a uh, couple other things. Like this, since CDs have become dominant, has that changed at all the way you have worked, uh, the uh, way you've recorded, the way you've done your album cover art, yeah, anything? Yeah, it's uh, actually been a pretty wide-ranging change of things that uh, suddenly the record, which we are always consider as sort of the standard medium for, for all years past, is no longer anymore. In fact, it's definitely an endangered species. So certainly in, in the terms of cover artwork, you're trying to deal with something that can be perceived and dealt with in a 3 by 5 you know, piece of cardboard in a cassette box or in uh, the 5 by 5 CD, CD box or 6 by 6 or whatever it is. Um, that's part of it. But also in terms of the music, you know, um, the division between side one and side too, for instance, was always a really important part of the running order to us. And you'd decide, you know, sort of the progress of side one and, and what song should end side one. And then a lot of times the song that began side two would be an important consideration and there would be a flow in terms of, of the dynamics of it, almost almost comparable to a live performance, that uh, two sides really made uh, much more interesting and, and much more uh, workable, where when you're dealing with a CD where it's essentially all one side, uh, you have to rethink that too. But the other parameters of time are very positive, you know, having more time to work with. Um, it hit us on both of the last two records in terms of the live album. We knew that we wanted it to be a single CD because we weren't about to ask people to pay, you know, a ridiculous amount of money to buy two CDs just to get a couple of extra songs. So it limited our choice of material in uh, wanting it to be, I forget, 72 minutes or something like that that it had to be to fit on one CD. But in terms of uh, the Presto album, it set us free because we weren't worried about 40 minutes being the, the uh, ultimate length of a record or the ideal length of a record, 20 minutes aside, suddenly with a CD or a cassette, um, the limitations were, were much greater so we could uh, have more songs and thus uh, spread out more stylistically, you know, because when, when you're judging uh, individual approaches, a lot of times 
as, as more songs get written, uh, you're thinking about what's been written already and uh, stylistically what you would still like to cover. So having more time to work with allows you to get, I think, more into the corners stylistically and, and to uh, bring out things that are maybe a little more eccentric than you might have, uh, than you might have bothered to put into a 40-minute piece. So um, I, I think, yes, the, the, the difference has been uh, pretty evolutionary. In, in the show that, that you're bringing to town in a couple of weeks, is there anything special going on, anything new, anything different that people, you know, will, will be interested in seeing? <laughs> uh, long, I mean, long-time Rush fans, you know, because yeah, you guys different. seem to have a very, you know, a very solid base of fans, who just very devoted to the band, and et cetera, and I just wondered what's new for them. Yeah, it's always really hard to answer because you don't like to... Uh, to sort of pump out the hype in one sense and uh, in another sense you hate to spoil the surprise yeah. but uh, in uh, in broad parameters at least we did rethink it from the ground up you know as far as choosing the material we would play both new songs and and particularly in old songs you know which old songs we would continue to play and which old ones we haven't played for a while that we would bring back so I think the substance of the show is, is very much different than it has been in uh, preceding tours as far as the presentation goes again we tried to rethink from the ground up and not do anything just because that's the way we did it last time you know so, so the whole visual presentation of um, for instance rear screen videos have always been a big part of our show but a lot of those um, they can tend to become cumulative in the same sense of playing the same songs every tour. You tend to same, show the same films to accompany them. So again, we threw out that presumption and dropped a lot of the films that we've used in the past and created some new ones, both for new and old songs. And um, sometimes kept the song but dropped the film, you know, just, just to keep something uh, fresh about it and also to avoid staleness I guess in the, in the uh, opposite side so it, it, there is a big there was a big rethink right from the ground up and I think the show is very different but at the same time we're still drawing from the same well of material a, a, a definite healthy balance in the course of a two hour show between uh, old and new stuff and there'll be surprises in songs maybe that people haven't uh, heard for a while if they've seen us live from tour to tour that will be a pleasant surprise to hear do you uh, do you play the pass yes good okay because that's my favorite. Oh, good. Um, I really like that. Right. I, I like your drumming on it. I mean, there's just some, some you know, little little intricacies that I really find attractive, but I think the whole song is just great. Oh, so, that's you know. interesting. It's always nice to know which songs people respond to the strongest, but uh, it's funny in a, in, a, in addressing the drum part particularly is, is that it's essentially so simple and... Uh, through Modern Drummer magazine, I got a letter complaining, in fact, that uh, thought the drumming on this album was was too simple, <laughs> and it just was so stupid because um, I spent more time on individual drum parts for this for this album than ever ever in the past. You know, just constantly refining down each little element of what I was doing and why, and uh, some of the passages took more time individually to come up with than any of the more overtly complicated stuff we've done in the past. But part of the the essence of that is or part of the essence of any kind of proficiency, I guess, is making the difficult look simple. So if you spend all that time, like the past, the drum part took me days of work to refine down to be exactly what I wanted it to be. But in essence, from a, from a technical point of view, it, it's, it's relatively simple to play. And so consequently, from a superficial judgment of, of a young, you know, teenage drummer who just wants to see Flash, <laughs> it seems simple. But if, it's, it's the old thing of, is, if it's easy to play, that must mean it was easy to think of, which of course is not the case. And, <laughs> you know, I remember when I was starting out, young guitar players would learn a Jeff Beck guitar solo, and they'd think, hey, I'm as good as Jeff Beck. <laughs> yeah, try writing it, you know, try yeah, creating it. The contradictions in that are obvious, but they're not obvious to a beginner. You know, you think if you can play it, you could have written it. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's that's probably true of all the arts. You know, it's a, a constant criticism of painting. You know, oh, my kid could paint that, you know. When I was in, in, especially in high school, and I think we took this uh, extremely seriously, you have long-running arguments of whether Jimmy Page was a better guitar player than, than Steve Howe, you know, yeah. and, and, and such. And uh, you yeah. know, we always we the one thing that we ever agreed on was that it, it came down to writing and who wrote better songs. And, mm. and that's yeah, I was glad to realize from the beginning too. It was a really an important insight that I had in my young years is the difference between taste and quality. <laughs> you know, that I could recognize, for instance, Eric Clapton, I always thought was a good guitar player, but never really liked his guitar playing. Uh -huh. Whereas there's a lot of music that I know isn't that great technically, like a lot of reggae and 
a lot of R&B and stuff, but I still really like it. Mm -hmm. And uh, just learning that difference to say, well, this isn't that great, but I really like it, or this is great, but I don't really like it. You know, it's, it's a really important distinction to make, but a lot of people um, never do make it about music. They think if they like something, it's great, and if they don't like it, it's shit. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a very simple equation for them, but of course, in, in any kind of art, it doesn't really apply. Yeah. Uh, let me leave you with this observation, and that is, you know, people, I, I think Rush is a good example of that, you know, where there, there are people who, you know, I mean, I tell people I like Rush, and, you know, they kind of cringe. And, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you know, I mean, that's, I, and I'm sure you know, oh, that, I know, you know it's yeah. just a fact of life, sure. but, you know, people ask me why, and I, and I think after this album, I finally, you know, I, I've got a really good idea of why, and the reason is because, I mean, I'm 31 now, and, I, you know, I think Rush is playing the kind of music uh, that that even though it's the 90s you're, there's there's still a lot of throwback to the 70s yeah. and uh, and that's when I grew up and you're playing the kind of music that I like but I'm I'm you know older now and I'm smarter now and I can enjoy it and I don't have the hassles of uh, teenage life to contend with sure. and uh, so that's, uh, the, that's a very good observation, actually. It's one that people often miss, is that we are still writing for our peers. And a lot of people of your age and my age, I'm only a few years older than you, yeah. a lot of our peers have grown out of music and no longer really have any interest in it. Um, so they don't really come into the equation, but guys like you and I who grew up through the 70s and loved all those bands and that, we have, we have our lives have gotten bigger. You know, they've gotten broader and our interests have gotten more subtle and uh, our the uh, parallels that we draw to life are more interesting now and uh, that's all the stuff that I think has changed our music over the years too is we've grown up with it and when I look out into the audience like last night and see a few bald heads and a few mustaches <laughs> and a few couples who have obviously had to get a babysitter to come to the Rush show you know I think yes you know that, those are the kind of people that are most gratifying I mean it's nice to have people there that weren't even born when we started playing together I, that is very gratifying in another way but in a sense it, it's more it's deeper somehow to have grown up with somebody you know for when I get letters too from people that you know got into our music in college and now that they're out in the world they're you know set designers or writers or scientists or you know whatever but Rush is still a part of their lives and I think uh, of all the tributes I think that's probably the highest one that you've stayed part of someone's life through all of the changes that from teenage to adulthood mm -hmm. through all the changes that that engenders yeah and then you've been able to change also I mean obviously you're not playing the same songs I mean you're, you're, you're there's variety in your music and, but it's it's still there I mean there's still the, the you know, a hold. Uh, you know, I can hear a little Emerson, like and Palmer, or a little sure. Yes, or something like oh, that. Yeah. And I think, oh, that's good because you know those guys are either not doing it anymore. Uh, well, in the case of Emerson, like and Palmer, or in the case of Yes, they're not doing it nearly as well. So, yeah, I understand uh, what you mean. Anyway, well, when you're uh, here, are you going to have the afternoon free to go to a museum? Um, or do you not know? Because I was our art uh, writer is sitting next to to me here, and I was going to ask him if there's someplace special that you should go to see. Right. Well, I have an excellent little guide called. Um Art in America Museum Guide, uh -huh. and it gives all the art museums in the United States and what traveling exhibitions they have and what their hours are and what their address is, so it's been kind of my Bible this tour, oh, and okay. whenever I have a day in a city, uh, wherever it is, you know, I just look up what they have and then uh, choose what to go and see. I see. I see. So I know Indianapolis is in there. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> then you don't need our recommendation. Okay. Well, I really enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, I look likewise. forward to seeing the show. Okay, thanks, Mark. Okay, thank you. Talk to you. Bye. Again. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tapes Archive podcast. Please remember you can always find more information about the show and the individual episodes at our website, thetapesarchive.com. Until next time, the vault is closed.